Howdy, everybody, and welcome back to Left the Chat. My name is Jason. I'm here with Stephen. We are continuing our discussion about Karl Marx's Capital, specifically the long chapter 15. It might be the longest chapter in the book. It is, My uh, God. We what a slog. A little bit of a slog. <laughs> yeah, that's the best way to describe it. Um, first impressions of the chapter, Steve? Yeah, like I was telling you off the camera, man, like, you know, the the main ideas of the chapter are really good is this is the chapter which pretty much deals a lot with the concept of automation, you know, kind of the the beginnings of that kind of concept. So um, it was especially it's it feels especially relevant to now. But I, I just feel, you know, and this is kind of a feeling that I've had now that we're, you know, made it to chapter 15. You know, Marx just really needed a goddamn editor, man, or so, way better editor to take some writing classes or something. Dude, I, it's, a, it's a struggle. He, it's a yeah, it's a class struggle reading. Uh, he, yeah, his, he repeats his, himself his a yeah. lot, dude, and he like he 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 just has these run-on sentences that go on the book, forever. The, I mean, just volume. I mean, this is multiple volumes, but just volume one could have been probably half half the length. I mean, look, I was, I was holding this to show, how, like, this is just chapter 15 out of, out of Right, the it was, book, it was so. massive. Like this, this chapter I felt was like, you know, I remember Harvey saying how like uh, chapter three was going to be a slog and, and yeah, the chapter was a little slow, but honestly, I found it really interesting and it felt a lot faster than this one. This one was like, took a while. I don't know why. It's maybe, I guess, I think it's just the length, like you said, was especially. Yeah. So, well, let's, let's talk about what, what the chapter is about. I mean, it's, it's an uh, extension titled, about it. It's titled, <laughs> it's titled Machinery and Large Scale Industry. And then this is when uh, Marx really gets into the weeds of how uh, machinery under the capitalist framework, uh, you know, impacted workers, uh, impacted uh, the unemployment base and labor and, you know, how, how it increased surplus value for the capitalists. Um, Marx is very, uh, I, I don't know, uh, pessimistic about machines, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know if, if all of, I mean, the chapter is relevant, like you were saying, but I don't know if all of it is uh, spot on to how things kind of like have carried out, carried out with the uh, invention of machines. I mean, he, he makes it sound in some chapters like uh, machines are really, you know, detrimental to labor. But I mean, at the same time, machines have made certain industries much easier on on workers but we'll we'll talk about all that yeah so on page 492 you know he, there's this quote here machinery is meant to cheapen commodities and by shortening the necessary labor in order to lengthen surplus labor time which i think is you know kind of the, the crux of what this entire chapter is about is marx explaining how uh, you know this going kind of i think he introduces this concept um in, in a few chapters back um, how, you know, if you cheapen the commodities that workers need to subsist um, th and you cheapen their labor, then you expand the amount of surplus value that you gain because you don't have to pay them as much uh, real wages because the goods no longer cost as much. Yeah, so then and so it's kind of, this is like a kind of an expansion. This chapter is a kind of an expansion of that idea that he introduced. Early. Yeah, so it's it's broken up into ten sections, and over those ten sections, essentially, I guess the the um, arc of the narrative is, you know, machines are they're used to replace the workers, and then um, those replaced workers uh, are added to this, you know, growing reserve army of of laborers. You know, we talked previously about this unemployment base that is used to like threaten. Uh, the, the labor, right, uh, mm -hmm. which then in turn increases this labor supply and then tends to, you know, push down wages. Um, and then at the same time, he talks about how the use of machines allows more like females and, and uh, women and ch children yeah. to, to use machinery because it's easier, like more easy tasks to do. Mm -hmm. And then like wait, continuing how machines are used to like de-scale the workers and then make them more really slaves to capitalists and how machines really just like take precedent to capital over the needs of, of workers. I guess that's right. the whole arc of the it, chapter. Pretty much. And, you know, I think the question that he asks is, uh, he asks the reader um, is, you know, is technological change always a good thing? Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, I think that's what he said. He's asking the reader and he's kind of presenting this argument that, you know, not always. And, uh, you know, I think in one of the chapters, I think, I think, or excuse me, in part three, I believe, um, he talks about, uh, he starts talking about the Luddites at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Where he's like, you know, the, you know, that whole movement uh, about the workers who started smashing 
uh, I think it was uh, loons. Yeah, it was like a, it was like a secret oath uh, movement kind of labor movement where like the secret society, not really a society, but people by you know secret would uh, then organize to like smash machines mm. and stuff on the factory floors and stuff. Right, because they they viewed these machines. Oh, these machines are you know taking our jobs, you know essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, you know, Marx kind of presents it like eventually they kind of caught up, caught, you know, got, got wise and were like, you know, it's not actually not the machine that's the problem. It's the capitalists that are using the machines and how they're using it to intensify our labor to uh, expand their uh, surplus value and profits, not really to make our lives easier. So he says that, you know, if machines instead were about, you know, uh, lightening the load and the toil of the worker and lessen the immiseration of the worker, then that would be one thing. But they're actually used to, and like, like I just said, it, it really to intensify. intensify like, yeah, I think you mentioned that 492 quote. Like it, he says, like every other instrument for increasing productivity of labor, the machine is a means for producing surplus value. So, uh, mm -hmm. well, let, let me frame that in the context of him starting off the first section, which is called the development of machinery. Um, quoting economists at the time, John Stuart Mill's Principles of Political Economy, he's, where uh, John Stuart Mill asks, it's questionable if all me the mechanical inventions yet made have lightened the day toil of any human being. And so Marx asserts, you know, throughout this chapter that no machinery hasn't necessarily uh, lightened the workload. We'll talk about in one section about the intensification of labor um, and allowing the capitalists to really, you know, intensify the amount of tasks people are doing, even since these tasks are, you know, simpler and like they're de-skilled to, to be able to do these tasks. Um, yeah, so I, think, I, I think that's the quote that I had in mind when I was saying right. the whole toil thing. I was like, I'm mm -hmm. remembering something. I didn't realize, I didn't remember, I guess, that it was John Stuart Mill who actually said it. So yeah, throughout that first section, I mean, the development of machinery, he, he really gets into how machines uh, kind of came into the process um, and he distinguishes how uh, a machine is really essentially a complex tool. He distinguishes between tools and machines. Uh, so a machine is essentially a complex tool that's powered by a natural force or an external source of power, such as water, or wind, electricity, etc. And it's made up of quote unquote tools per se in this like mechanic, mechanized form, mechanized form. And then a tool uh, versus a machine is powered by a laborer. So like a hammer is just, you know, by the hammer, uh, by the labor. By caloric um, power. Yes. <laughs> So that said, it's the instruments of labor themselves that serve as the starting point of machinery and the function of a machine is to replicate the processes the laborer previously did with their tools at the detriment of the laborer. Um, because instead of the worker's skill dictating the labor process, um, machinery causes the laborer to have more of a supporting role, more of like a cog in this uh, giant machine that is then what he talks about to be the factory, which is, you know, the a bunch of these machines uh, working together in this giant uh, location, right? Yeah, like he, I believe he, he gives like a really lengthy, uh, let's see if I can find it here. He gives it a really lengthy definition of 501. I'm not going to read the whole damn thing, but if you mm -hmm. want to, if the people watching this want to go look at it, it's on page 501 where he describes what a factory is. But like you said, essentially, it's a comb combination of machines put together into, you know, a uh, streamlined process to produce a, a specific thing. Uh, and so it's just a bunch of machines working together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's one there's one great, great quote that I have written down here. I'm not sure what page it's on, but it's in section one. Um, and he's, you know, Marx is always using these uh, analogies of like organs. And I mean, previously we've heard about like vampires and things like that. So he always used these little analogies. Appendages, right? so, appendages. Appendages. He says, an organized system of machines to which motion is communicated by the transmitting mechanism from a central automation is the most developed form of production by machinery. Here we have, in the place of the isolated machine, a mechanical monster whose body builds whole factories and whose demon power first veiled under the slow and measured motions of his giant limbs, at length breaks out into the fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs. It's he's very, demon, very he's dramatic. demon power? Yes. Demon power in there? And who's demon power? You know, I just imagine like this guy, like, like just grabbing a bunch of levers and mm -hmm. steam coming out, you know, that's what I feel like, that's what I visualize in my yeah, head. Yeah, and I, I mean, you saying, you saying that reminds me that, um, you know, Marx, I, I don't believe, it, to, to my knowledge, had any, you know, direct experience uh, in factories and such. I mean, the, the problem with his analysis through this chapter is that he's basing his, um, 
his analysis off of one, I think it's Engel's experience in factories in Manchester at the time. And he's also basing his uh, writing on uh, on the writings of these other two dudes, which I have somewhere in my notes, but these other two dudes that well, wrote, no, he, they're more like pro-capitalist and writing a lot about, you know, what the, the machinery system is and everything. I know. And he's also, he heavily, heavily using the uh, factory reports, the, mm -hmm. the factory inspector reports. He, he based a lot of his analysis on that, but definitely Engels too. I think, Eng I'm trying to remember now, but I think Engels' family, his father or something, owned factory. So a right. lot of the information he got was from Engels. You know, he didn't actually go. I think Harvey is the one who said that he actually never really stepped foot into a factory. I don't know if that's yeah, true. yeah, no, yeah. Har Harvey Harvey mentions how Marx's um, analysis is a little one-sided um, at some point. I, I, we'll get to that. So yeah, I mean, that section when he's talking about the development of machines, he also mentions how uh, you know machines are used to create other machines and create better machines, and you know, it's a perpetual process that leads, I guess, to more and more automation. Um, section two, the value transferred by the machinery to the product. He basically asked, how is the value transferred from machine to the product? Um, so it's through that, you know, depreciation. He talks a lot about how, you know, we mentioned before, you know, a tenth of the machine is uh, the value of the machine is put into the, the commodity over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, he, we've talked about that a lot already. Like this is, he repeats this here where, you know, it's like mm -hmm. machines can't create value. That's part right. two. Part two is like, yeah. remember guys, machines don't create value, they just in, transfer their value to chapter, the product. Yeah, back in chapter eight, he mentioned how um, machines don't create any new value, they only transfer their existing value into the final product. So he appeals to that idea, like we talk, I was saying about depreciation or how a percentage, percentage of the machine's value goes into the product over time. But then he goes on to say that the use of machinery for the exclusive purpose of cheapening the product is limited by the requirement that less labor must be expended in producing machinery than is displaced by the employment of the machinery. For the capitalist, however, there is a further limit on its use. Instead of paying for the labor, he pays only the value of the labor power employed. The limit to his using a machine is therefore fixed by the difference in value of the machine and the value of labor power placed by it. All that is to say that the capitalist needs to calculate, you know, that cost benefit difference between buying a machine and then the value it's, uh, that's saved on employing labor. So if it's going to be uh, beneficial for capitalists to, you know, save money getting a machine, then they're going to, you know, uh, fire their laborers. If the labor is cheaper, then they're going to hire uh, people to do that job. Yeah, that's right. He does define the productivity of a machine, right? It's measured by how many people can essentially replace. Mm -hmm. In summary, in section two, the value of the machine gets passed on to the commodity through depreciation. It's plain and simple, but there's a few caveats that he kind of brings up to it. Um, in section three, he talks about the most immediate effects of the machine production on the worker. So he considers these consequences of machinery for the worker and examines the relationship between technologies and social relations. So what real the implications uh, of machinery on the worker. This is where he kind of talks about, you know, how, you know, since machines can perform this intense uh, labor, they, they're able to replace these stronger, you know, workers and then allow women and children to do these these lighter tasks. Right, because you no longer need, you know, a strong ass man to pick up a sledgehammer and hit man, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, hit whatever rocks all day. There's a machine that could do it. So somebody weaker can uh, can come and use the machine, which has all these effects on family life. Right? He did, yeah, he, he talks about, about, about social the family relations. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he talks a lot about the social relations among the family, how that started to change. And I'm sure that it has, you know, tremendous sociological impacts, you know, like, you know, how men started relating to their wives and wives to their men. And, you know, I'm sure this also, I mean, always, as we have talked about at length, especially in chapter 10, the working day, how children started getting employed, um, you know, and, and, you know, this kind of like really, you know, capital seized upon cheaper labor in the form of like, I don't need to pay these guys, you know. He, he uh, likens it to like slave labor for like the parents, like, uh, kind of selling off their kids to go work in, mm -hmm. in factories, you know. I mean, he, this is a little, a little, he was a little off in, in this analysis, I think, because, I mean, obviously, over time, there's been these child labor laws and, you know, um, and there's, labor for children has gotten significantly better since since his time. Right, for sure, for sure, at least in the West. Um, mm -hmm. One one interesting part about part three is, uh, well, there's several, points but um on page 528 he kind of introduces this idea of moral depreciation um, right which, which is uh, a strange a strange way to to 
call what what's really like economic obsolete obsolescence, right? Like, right, sort of. It basically, saying that it, uh, a machine it loses exchange value either because machines of the same sort are being produced more cheaply than it is, or because better machines are entering into competition with it. Um, so this is kind of the idea that um, capitalists are constantly facing competition in the form of better machines. So you go and you buy, you know. Uh, Three thousand dollar MacBook Pro, mm -hmm. um, and then you know that's good for like a year or two, but then like the next better you know computer comes out in two years, and then suddenly your thing isn't worth as much because there's just like this better thing. So what's interesting about this though is because um, it has this effect on the labor process in that when when a machine is first purchased, there's a super spike in intensity about the amount of labor being used. Um, and usually extending the working day. Fundamentally, yeah, they, you the capitalists the want to they want to use it day. as fast as possible. They want to exactly. Use the they want to like to stay ahead of the competition and you know lengthen mm -hmm. the working days. So. Exactly, because like the whole this gets back to our the kind of idea we were talking about at, at the beginning of the video, where um, we were like, shit, you know, these these machines should be helping us, should be lowering our, our time that we work or whatever, or make it less you know toil and less less work. But in, in, in reality, because of the nature of competition, when the machine is purchased and starts to be used, the capitalists are making you work longer on it so they can get their money back faster before this next thing basically causes the machine, their investment to uh, depreciate. Um, one thing that I understand is a flaw in, in something Marx talks about in this section three is that um, he talks about how the, how, you know, the wages um, have pushed down because of the introduction of machinery. But in reality, I mean, if you look at... Uh, kind of history of capitalism since Marx's time, you know, some some real wages have soared. I mean, let's not count those last like 80, uh, 40, 40 years, like since the 80s where like, you know, there's been this spike in productivity, but, you know, real wages haven't soared. But since Marx's time until like the 80s, um, real wages under capitalism did uh, tend to increase. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to defend capitalism. <laughs> It's okay, man. There are certain points. There, 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 there are certain, certain things. things well, yeah. it, there are definitely things that it does well, and you know, I, you know, like we said at the very beginning of uh, this entire project, this mm -hmm. isn't like we're not trying to be Marxist apologists. We're trying to like critically analyze it. But the man made a lot of good points, but he's also made mistakes. And there are things that, in a sense, like capital is very good about, you know, organizing production, mm -hmm. in the sense of like being able to produce a lot of things in a short amount of time and. and produce a lot of material uh, goods, but, you know, at the expense of uh, social relations, at the expense of workers, at the expense of inequality, at the expense of the planet, you know what I'm saying? Like, right, right. Uh, there's all these other detrimental factors that we're exploring this book, but there are Pause. some things that are Because my, my dog's taking a shit really quick, so. <laughs> I'm just gonna clean it up really quick so it doesn't show, smell like shit. Cut. All right. Well, to yeah, to finish off section section three, it talks about like I mentioned the intensification of labor, um, and one thing that's interesting about this is you know throughout the entire cap book capital, he assumes that all this labor is performed at a constant intensity, um, but that's unrealistic considering that you know in real life humans get tired and hungry and worn out throughout the day, um, causing their ability to perform labor to decrease. Uh, the last really thing yeah i mean that's that's section three just about uh section four like we're talking about it gets into describing what the factory is and like we mentioned it's a bit one-sided uh being that he generalizes all factories to be like how they are in uh the accounts of ingles uh, experience with this manchester manchester uh england industrialism um and then the two guys that i mentioned these guys called babbage and r who were the day's leading pro-capitalist uh, promoters uh, i guess so uh, Babbage. Babbage and I are. I don't think I have much to say, uh, really about to be honest that. with you. <laughs> like, the yeah, like, it, I mean, like it, there's like, there's parts of this shit, like in part, like all, all the crap about the factory that it's like, all right, man, like, this was really yeah. I guess, I mean, the, the whole takeaway with, with section four is, you know, he describes again, the de-skilling that accompanies the rise of the factory system. And then, you know, labor becomes more and more similar. And then workers kind of move from machine to machine and they're all zombie-like and they're like, we're all drained of purpose and meeting and re easily replaceable. And, you know, factory work just sucks, right? Like he really <laughs> like, factories suck. That's basically the takeaway there. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, he, he literally says here's the quote page 548 factory work exhausts the nervous system to the uttermost both in bodily and in intellectual activity essentially he's saying that laborers are not really supposed to think they're just supposed to you know mine their machines yeah they, um, they themselves become automatons one the important another important takeaway that i do want to talk about in, in section four is he talks about how this hierarchy of workers um comes out of the factory system uh he, you know he talked previously about the division of labor he talked well we should have mentioned earlier that he talks even in, in with machines there's this division of labor right and because like one machine is doing one part of a commodity and then you know etc there's other parts you know creating the whole um but he talks insofar as a division of labor reappears in the factory um he says that workers are subjected to capitalists and he says this quote unquote autocratic power he says a superior class of workers in part scientifically educated in part trained in handicrafts they stand outside the realm of factory workers and this division of labor is purely technical so basically you have uh you have the capitalists you have engineers and mechanics and these machine builders um and then you have i guess there's managers who are overseeing the factory and then you have the majority of people who are these workers who are essentially the cogs in the machine that is the factory. Yeah, I think uh, that kind of reminds me of that that whole uh, quote that I read on uh, the, the Jack London book the other day, the mm -hmm. other day, like last video about the whole caste system within the different workers and stuff and how that that's used, you know, by the capitalists to pit workers against each other instead of all obviously uniting together as common brothers in the struggle, brothers and sisters in the struggle. And, that's a perfect, perfect segue into section five, where he talks about the struggle between worker and machine, which you brought up earlier, how, you know, workers see machines as a threat to their labor and their livelihood, really, because, I mean, they, they're slaves uh, to, to these wages. So if... <laughs> He's like, play with me, bro. Enough about Marx. <laughs> so if machines are, are replacing labor, look at that. So if machines are replacing labor, um, you know, then labor is, is uh, threatened by them. Um, and that's where he talks about, you know, the Luddite movement, where this, there's a machine breaking movement in which these workers would protest their de-skilling and loss of jobs by smashing the machine. So yeah, so workers saw machines as their competitors, um, but at the same time, Marx talks about how it gave the government this pretext for, you know, these reactionary measures uh, against the workers. So, you know, the Luddite movement I guess kind of backfired in, in a way because the uh, government, it gave the anti-Jacobin government, he says, a pretext for the most violent and reactionary measures. So he seems to suggest that machines are not necessarily the problem, but you know, the social relations under capitalism are the problem. Yeah, um, so there's, there's two good points that I want to make in this specific part that I thought were really relevant and that are heard kind of arguments from, from what I talk use a lot of time when they talk about automation. So I'm going to read this, this, this part of this quote. It's very long, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. And I'll kind of talk about it. So on page 557, he says, uh, the instrument of labor, when it takes the form of a machine, immediately becomes a competitor of the worker himself. The self-valorization of capital by means of the machine is related directly to the number of workers whose conditions of existence have been destroyed by it. The whole system of capitalist production is based on the worker sale of his labor power as a commodity. The division of labor develops this labor power in a one-sided way by reducing it to the highly particularized skill of handling a special tool. When it becomes the job of the machine to handle this tool, the use value of the worker's labor power vanishes, and with it, its exchange value. The worker becomes unsaleable, like the paper money thrown out of the currency by legal enactment. When machinery seizes on an industry by degrees, it produces chronic misery among the workers who compete with it. When, the, when transition is rapid, the effect is acute and is felt by the great mass of people. So I thought this was particularly an interesting passage because, and I, and I jumped around there just to kind of make this point, because a lot of the time, um, you know, you know, the right, the conservative parties, they like to say like, oh, automation's not a big deal. It's just going to free up all of this capital and free up all of these people. And these guys could just retrain and that capital will flow to another industry. And then, you know, they'll just, you know, like take up these new jobs and everything will be hunky dory. But that takes, that that leaves out the whole idea that, wait a second, you are throwing out all of these workers and then they're going to flood all of these other industries 
So all of a sudden, it's like the same idea, the whole idea where like all the truck drivers that are going to be, you know, and Yang talks about this all the time, all the truck drivers that are going to be automated away with the eventuality of self-driving machines or self-driving cars, um, that is going to have a tremendous impact on the transportation industry. I forgot the exact statistics, but right. you know, a ton of people are, are employed as truck drivers. The whole idea there's like, oh, we're just going to reskill these guys and they're all going to become programmers or some shit is number one, a ludicrous idea because that it's it's not going to be that easy to transition people that have been driving trucks their entire life to be suddenly become programmers and two what's that going to do for the people that are currently programmers it's going to reduce their wages because all of a sudden you're going to have all this huge supply of programmers and then you're just screwing another side right of the that's, spectrum. that's that's really what uh what section six is actually about is the compensation theory it says mm -hmm. the title is the compensation theory with regard to the workers displaced by machinery. Um, and like you were talking about, just to kind of tie it into what you're just saying, you know, and Harvey talks about how there's this tendency um, to blame um, outsourcing and competition, you know, specifically by like Mexico and China um, from low, these low wage labor countries for these ills of the, the US working class, right? But apparently studies show that um, two thirds of job losses are due actually to technological change. And like you were talking about the move towards automation. It's mm -hmm. not all just outsourcing. Um, yeah. So that's that's talk. Let's talk then about the compensation theory in section six, which is where he talks about the relationship between capital and labor as a consequence of these technological changes. Uh, so essentially, the compensation theory is that um, machines allow this free up of capital to employ displaced workers, right? Um, but Marx actually argues that you know these displaced workers, like you were saying, you know. Um, don't necessarily compensate for the, the loss of jobs by these machines. So like, and at the same time, you know, while some labor may be reabsorbed, you know, as, as production expands, the amount, Marx argues, may be problematic because not everybody can necessarily, you know, transition from being, you know, a truck driver to a programmer or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, he, he talks about this, this whole part of the working class becoming these unproductive people, right, with this development of machinery, that all, all who are too old or too young for work, all unproductive women, young persons and children. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like steel workers can't become computer programmers just overnight. And I mean, it kind of reminds me of this whole idea of the Green New Deal transitioning uh, fossil fuel workers into, uh, you know, renewable energy workers, right? That, that actually makes freaking sense. I think we, I, I think I posted something in our Discord channel the other day about how, or maybe it was our Instagram, I don't know, one of those things that coal workers, the coal worker unions came out recently and they were like, yo, like we're Our actually favorite. on board with this, but you know, we don't want to be thrown on the street. Like we want to guarantee that you're going to take us, the people that are going to be displaced because we, we know we acknowledge that there's a climate crisis going on and we want to do something about it. We don't want to keep extracting these, 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 uh, you know, rare earth metals and shit, but train us to be, use our mechanical skills, our knowledge to then train us on these renewable energy uh, uh, industries. And mm -hmm. that's great. You know what I mean? That's the workers themselves, the unions coming out and, and, and saying this. And that's a much more, I feel, transferable skill set than saying, oh, yeah, all you guys are not going to become fucking data scientists or some shit. Like, are you kidding me? Like, not saying that people are not incapable of doing that, but, you know, people have to eat in between the three, four, five years it takes for you to Training, become a data yeah. scientist. You know what right. I'm saying? You're probably much more, you'll, you could take, uh, coal miners or coal workers and stuff like that and train them probably a little easier to become mechanical workers in a different energy extracting business and something completely different, you know, uh, that, that people have been touting for on the other side. Yeah. So just to kind of sum up section six. Um, oh, wait, Mark I do want to make one point here yeah. um, that, he, that on page 5, 567, I'm going to read this small quote because this is also a very important part about the, uh, the effects of displacement of workers. Um, which essentially is that when you displace a bunch of workers, the demand for products uh, goes down because all of a sudden you don't have all these workers that can fucking pay for the shit that you're producing. So if you throw 20,000 workers out in the street, suddenly that's it, it goes back to this concept that Marx explored back early in this book about mm -hmm. how there's buyers and sellers, right? And every buyer is also a seller and every seller is also a buyer, right? So you're a seller of labor power, but you're also a buyer of commodities. And all of a sudden, if you're no longer getting compensated for your labor, you're no longer able to sell your labor. You no longer then can buy commodities. So he says here on five, uh, 567, um, and, he, and he was, and this is going to seem a little weird because he was talking, he was making this example about carpets, but I'm just going to go with it. So he says, with carpets thus transformed into 
1,500 pounds, they bought means of subsistence to the same value. These means, therefore, to, were to them not capital, but commodities. And they, as regards these commodities, were not wage laborers, but buyers. The circumstance that they were set free by machinery from the means of purchase changed them from buyers into non-buyers. Hence, a lessened demand for those commodities. And voila, if this diminution of demand is not compensated for by an increase in demand from another direction, the market price of the commodity falls. And this is how a another very important concept is that this reduction in demand not only affects the industry that is that did the replacing, but it affects other industries because suddenly workers are not getting paid. They can't, and then it starts affecting other industries because they're not buying their shit either. You mm -hmm. know, so unless this you know demand is somehow compensated in modern terms, if you can somehow you know find another market to sell your product, then you're safe. But if you can't do that, then you you're essentially fucking yourself. So I thought this yeah. was a very important uh, concept to bring up in this. It's, part. it's essentially that commodities are still being produced by machines, but demand has decreased to due to unemployment. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. So, I mean, Marx doesn't get into too much detail, but poses this uh, conundrum of like how displaced workers by machines should be compensated, right? Um, if capitalists are saving all this variable capital, remember variable capital is labor power or labor, labor uh, cost. Labor costs. Um, if they're saving all this variable capital by employing fewer laborers, then what do they do with the capital they save? And then how should workers be compensated by this, you know, machines then creating the value? into the product. He doesn't get into too much detail, but he poses this huge uh, problem with what uh, the bourgeoisie should do with this excess capital. Um, so moving on to section seven, entitled The Repulsion and Attraction of Workers to the Development of Machine Production, Crises in the Cotton Industry. Um, this basically, to sum up, he recognizes the, the elasticity, sorry, the ebbs and flows of capitalism. He recognizes that capitalism has these periods of of booms and, and busts, expansions and, and contractions, basically what, what is the business cycle. Um, and we see that uh, today with you know the, the Great Recession, with uh, everything that, that's happened even just since Marx's time and the uh, crashes uh, that happened on every seven to 10 years, I think on average. Um, there's also something uh, else in this uh, in this part that I think is important on page 579, where he describes basically um, the advent of this intensified large-scale factory production um, drives up essentially the demand for raw materials uh, because you're suddenly you've intensified your production process so much that you start looking for other markets to uh, uh, to gather these raw materials, and it's basically um, intensifies colonialism. Um, and on, on 579, he says, on, uh, on the one hand, the immediate effect of the machinery is to increase the supply of raw materials. Thus, for example, the invention of the cotton gin increased the production of cotton. On the other hand, the cheapness of the articles produced by the machinery and the revolution and the means of transport and communication provide the weapons for the conquest of foreign markets. By ruining handicraft production of finished articles in other countries, machinery forcibly converts them into fields for the production of its raw materials. Thus, India was compelled to produce cotton, wool, hemp, jute, and indigo for Great Britain. By constantly turning workers into supernumeraries, large-scale industry in all countries where it has taken root spurs on rapid increases in immigration, emigration, and the colonization of foreign lands, which are thereby converted into settlements for growing the raw material of the mother country. Um, which is a huge thing that still happens to this day, that all of these kind of fringe, you know, dirty uh, jobs of mining all this crap has left these kind of industrial centers and instead gets, you know, you know, we have these crazy diamond and strip mines in Africa and all this stuff and all of this, stuff, you know, this extraction of raw materials from the third world, what's called the third world by colonialists. Um, you know, and that's what happened in all colonialism since, you know, 1490 fucking two is they get over there, they start taking all the rubber and all this shit. Um, and it just, basically my point is that capitalism has driven colonialism mm -hmm. for this extraction of raw materials in order to feed this production process and, and turns all these other countries into just basically, you know, centers for resource extraction. Yeah. And he, he ties that into how, uh, like I said, how capitalism has these booms and bust cycles. So like may maybe machinery or raw material haven't arrived uh, into another country. So there are certain places that, uh, or certain places where 
there is then slow growth uh, and then when it does appear everywhere then we see booms and growth mm -hmm. um, so that drive like you said colonialism and imperialism drives you know production of those commodities in other places mm -hmm. Uh, so then in section eight, the revolutionary impact of large scale industry on manufacture, handicrafts and domestic in industry. Um, so he, he basically recognizes here that, uh, you know, capitalism makes other sectors compete and destroys, you know, these old style manufacturing and handicraft labor, you know, it's kind of bitter towards, you know, these machines, you know, you know, taking away the, the hard work of people like creating things with their, with their hands, right? And these mm -hmm. handicrafts, um, especially as this factory system becomes more prevalent. Um, and I will say that Marx, I guess, he, he doesn't directly say, but he kind of alludes to, you know, this factory system really taking off and being like the future. And, you know, this is how things are going to exist from now on. Everything's going to just be a factory. So what's important here is that he, he brings up how when brought into competition with one another, these systems like handicraft undergo these adaptations and then they form these new hybrid forms. But the general result is that the conditions of those of the work on these hybrid forms becomes you know appalling if not intolerable and you know people have handicraft workers for example have to work five times as hard to compete with the products of power looms for example um so then section nine the health and education clause of the factory acts is a very long drawn out section where he examines the consequences of the factory acts and different you know legislations that happened um, in the time, uh, there are some benefits, but then at the same time, there were not. It's very drawn out. Not it's important, but not you know. Histor it's historically important, and yeah. basically, it, it's more of kind of what we're going to start off the discussion about. The factories basically fucking suck, and a lot of people died <laughs> as a result. And basically. there was a lot. He goes into a lot of detail about, like you just mentioned, like this this, this struggle for basically regulation, mm -hmm. so that there, you know we're so you know workers' hands will be cut off. And we can spend a little money on like protections for the workers so that they can actually continue producing the damn commodities you want them to. Which you would think that these guys would want to spend the, you know, I think in, some, in one part of that section, he's like, you know, the capitalists like, you know, talk about the horrors of like, you know, fingers getting cut off of the workers, but then they won't lift a fucking penny to actually, you know, put in guardrails or something to protect yeah. the workers. Yeah. 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 Um, so then section 10 is a small little section called large scale industry and agriculture. Um, he kind of uh, talks about how, I guess, you know, even under agriculture, I mean, with machinery, like labor gets more intense or something like that. I don't know if it's necessarily accurate to how things have turned out, like I mentioned before, but uh, that's basically chapter 15. Uh, he poses this conundrum of, you know, we're headed this direction with uh, machinery and automation, you know, what are we going to do about it? Um, let's have a revolution, right? <laughs> Pretty much. I, I liked, the, uh, I liked again, the, the, I felt like the automation stuff was very relevant. But again, like we talked about it, this man, this man desperately needed an editor because yeah. he just, yeah. he, 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 like shit he mentioned like three chapters ago, he's just, it feels almost like verbatim just talking about the same thing. Or in reality, I mean, if, if Ingalls was one to, to, you know, put everything together, then Ingalls was the editor, but then, like, he needed an editor. And... Yeah, <laughs> probably. You know, it's, it's curious, like, I, on, I got curious, and on Amazon, well, I, I, I'm going to ask you two things. One thing is, I, I want to, well, I guess I'm going to ask you the first question first, since you've been kind Makes of sense. reading, uh, you've been reading um, the companion. Uh, Harvey's Companion. Do you feel like if you had, reading both books, do you feel like if you had just read Harvey's Companion, at least up until this point, like you would have basically gotten the same information? Um, yes and no. I mean, it, it definitely, it serves more as like it's called a companion. I mean, you can read it by itself. You definitely like block quotes, like entire sections of the book that I now just like ended up reading twice. Um, mm -hmm. But it's but at the same time it's pointing out sections like oh I read through you know an entire chapter but then I didn't really realize that this paragraph was like super super relevant right and Harvey kind of gets into detail about that I think it could be read on its own but I mean it's definitely more beneficial reading it along with the book so right there are Maybe. I will say sorry I will say like um, for for chapter fifteen I mean when he gets into like really when Marx talks like gets into numbers and examples and stuff like that those are sections that I mean I'm gonna be honest I. I'm interested in the theory of the book. And I understand the historical examples, but I kind of skim over those sections, and then I use Harvey's guide as like a, a help on reinforcer. Right? And he sometimes he doesn't even bring those sections up. So. 
That makes sense. The other thing I was thinking about is uh, I got curious and I went on Amazon and I was like, you know, maybe there's like an abridged version. I wonder if somebody went out there and was just like, yo, can I take this book and basically extract the basically the main ideas and get rid of all the shit that is illustrated, the illustrated guy. If that's is there? Yeah. I, I don't know, that that might be interesting, but I found there is there is an abridged version of Capital and, I, and it's actually all three volumes and it's only like 500 or 600 pages. Right. So I'd be really curious of like then maybe eventually like you know years down the road I may pick that up and just like skim it just to see like damn like could I save myself a lot of fucking time and just get the abridged version um, that that probably would have saved us some time and you know maybe for our viewers out there you know maybe looking if you don't want to necessarily tackle uh, you know this 900 page behemoth in, in addition to the other two volumes you know maybe watching these videos watching the Harvey lectures and then you know picking up an abridged version. Uh, it's something much more doable to do. Well, y'all, until next time when we discuss, uh, finally get into part five, we're halfway done through the book. This is going to be in reverse uh, because of my camera, but it's the production of absolute and relative surplus value, starting with chapter 16, absolute and relative surplus value. Enjoy. All right, guys. All right. Later.